to be here. Um, so it was just a correct. Unfortunately, Matt Berry couldn't make it at the last minute, so very thankfully, Omri uh, Shaw is filling in for us today. Um, so I'm going to start, actually, I guess, with you, Nate, because you, you started off as a healthcare provider, and your career has evolved, and you now work in tech. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about the journey and how you got there. Yeah, so, um, you know, I started out as an EMT. Uh, EMT in 1998, I uh, absolutely loved patient care. Uh, so from 1998 to 2003, uh, I was an EMT intermediate, uh, ACLS and PALS, you know, ran, you know, eight to 12 calls a day and uh, just had the time of my life. I mean, I absolutely loved being a practitioner. I loved patient care uh, and, and uh, I just really liked helping humans. And so how did you get from there to tech? Well, that's a longer story. Uh, so the, the, the whole purpose behind kind of the journey mm -hmm. was I actually invented a medical device. Mm -hmm. uh, and that medical device was a track system that mounted at the bottom of an ambulance cot. So I didn't have to carry patients down flights of stairs. Uh, I mean, healthy people don't call 911 traditionally. And so what happens is that you had very big, you know, bariatric uh, overweight patients. And most of those people ended up in locations uh, that were really tough to get them out of, motor vehicle accidents, uh, two-story apartments. And, uh, and so what happened is after I had installed these tracks on my cot, I thought this would be a really good idea. I launched this to market. I thought it was a product that was really great for me, but I actually didn't talk to any other paramedics uh, like in New York or the Dakotas or Florida and found out that really that track device wouldn't work for them at all. And the reason why is that if you try to take an ambulance cot down a flight of stairs in New York in a brownstone apartment, I mean, it's 28 inches wide, right? I mean, Dublin has the same type of architecture, so that actually wouldn't have worked. And that's really what kind of started uh, the pivot into the hospital evacuation sled uh, called the Paraslide. And that sits in 70% uh, of the hospitals in the US. Uh, they're shipped all around the world as well, but I kind of went from an ambulance cot and track to, uh, to this Paraslide. And this had a tremendous amount of success, and this was acquired by Stryker Medical in 2009. And that was the introduction to hardware and software. So a lot of the devices at Stryker, from a patient transport perspective, um, you know, we, built a put a, we put a lot of software in our products. Okay. So anything that lifts and lowers an ambulance cot, right, there's a, ton of, there's a ton of technology in there. And then as an ambulance cot comes into the back of an ambulance, uh, it needs to recognize that ambulance cot to lift the, the ambulance cot in the back of the ambulance. So that's, that's kind of how tech started uh, and evolved. Okay, good. Yeah. And so yourself, Army, because you're not medical yourself in your background, but you've also ended up running a, a kind of a medical company. Well, and right. how did that happen for you? So as a background, a third startup that I'm involved with, and uh, about three and a half years ago, my father came to me uh, with a simple question. Mm -hmm. Did you see me inject my insulin? So he's diabetic and injects insulin four times a day. Wanted to see if I saw him. And my answer to that was no, meaning no, dad, I didn't see you. And he understood that as no, dad, you didn't inject it. Mm -hmm. And he went to the restroom and injected a second dose of insulin. <clears throat> so he's fine today. Uh, 30 more minutes, uh, it wouldn't be the case. And we've started thinking about how do people manage their medications because that's, you know, that might be deadly. Mm -hmm. And um, when we asked, first of all, my father, who's really technology oriented, why didn't you um, use any solution? He was like, I don't have any. Then I went to the biggest HMOs in Israel and asked them the same question. Why don't you have a solution for my father and many others? And they, they said, well, we don't have one. Can you bring us to it? So I brought them a, a solution a few years later, and the rest is history. Today, MediSafe is the number one medication management app uh, on the consumer end, 2.5 million downloads, hundreds of thousands of active users managing their medications through MediSafe. So I suppose as two people who have, you know, evolved in your careers, you know, from being a healthcare provider and you from being sort of a non-medical person to running a medical company, for me as a, as a doctor, I'm part of an industry that I feel is kind of crossing two divides. You know, when, when you train in medicine, there's a certain sense of, entre of uh, kind of apprenticeship in that you're taught by your peers, you're taught a lot of tradition, you're taught to carry on that tradition, and yet we're also considered to be, you know, we're supposed to be at the cutting edge, we're supposed to come up with new treatments, new ways of looking at things. 
The healthcare has been very slow to evolve. Probably in the tech industry, at least doctors have been a little bit slower to evolve from the way we do things. So have you any advice for how we get healthcare providers to embrace technology and to change? So we're right there. This is exactly what we do. So we've started fully consumer, and we're slowly shifting towards the healthcare system as we're growing. And when you start thinking about that, first of all, they need to know about you, right? So that's pure marketing. But more than that, what we found out is that physicians are very tilted towards research. We just released last week a study showing that MediSafe indeed increases adherence by 10 to 20 percent more than the control group. So that was one of them. And understanding the rules and the regulations in the space is very important as well. We're now HIPAA compliant, which is a barrier to entry in the US. So we're very black and white about things. We want, we want a rule and a regulation that will force us to change. Do you think so? Yeah. I, I mean, I think you know, the, reg the regulatory environment's tough. I mean, that's kind of why you know, I think that, I mean, that's what's impeded a lot of the progress. I think a lot of people actually want to embrace the change. But I think to his point, <clears throat> you know, the consumer side has broken that barrier down a right. ton. And then I think the aggregated data and surfacing it back up has really evolved and changed the way that we think. I know for sure you know, on, on, on wearables and aggregating all that normalized data uh, has absolutely had a profound impact on just the way that we think about you know, what it's going to do for humans on, on an ongoing basis. So, so when we're looking then, you're saying the consumers have driven the change and that they're the ones that drive the change of their doctors. And I, I would see that in my own practice. You know, a patient will come in and show me something or they'll mention an app that they have downloaded or they'll mention a website they've seen. And we're often the ones coming behind trying to keep up with it. But I also find sometimes as well is they have this consumer end product. So for instance, these wellness apps, these wearables, um, and they have a very particular personal goal that they want to achieve. But when you go to the corporate level and you're looking at you know, corporate health and corporate wellness, they're very concerned with the financial impact. So you go to a corporation that's installed a wellness program, they want to save money. Whereas the person at the end wants to get fit and healthy. So how can we maybe design programs or how can we look in health to try and marry both expectations to keep the corporates happy because in the end of the day, that's where the money's gonna come from. But how do you make the, the end user happy as well? Have you, you know, how do you marry both? You want to take this? Yeah, so, so we are very lucky. We are on one of those uh, unique places when, where it's good for anyone, right? So if we make sure that the patient takes his medication, good for the patient, good for the provider, good for the insurer, good for the employer. So that's a very unique place to be in the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, but, but you need to take the same uh, product kind of and, and fit the right language to the right um, healthcare constituents. So, so for the consumer, is, you're going to say, hey, you're going to take your meds, you're going to feel very well, et cetera, et cetera. For uh, the healthcare ecosystem, you come and say, hey, we improve adherence by tw 10 to 20% more. That reduces hospitalization. That's going to worth billions for you guys. So. So you focus on the outcomes for the healthcare providers, right. and then you go back and just keep the user happy. Okay, yeah, well, I, was, I mean, uh, you know, I, I take a look uh, at kind of at the operating model of companies, right? I mean, the, I think the reason why <clears throat> there's interests that are misaligned there is that fundamentally, like, the operating model from the CEO's perspective, they're looking at stop-loss claims, yeah. right? Which, which isn't a super healthy point of view uh, for the overall health and wellness for those individuals, right? Whereas, you know, a, a person that's in charge of wellness is actually trying to improve humans' lives. And the thing is, is that a lot of the outcomes from that aggregated data are actually pretty profound. Like, it's just not the fact that you get uh, happy, healthy employees, right? It's that they're more engaged at work. Okay. Uh, they're more productive at work. And so I think we, we've seen the wearables, but I think the, the, the progression that actually needs to happen is more platforms that aggregate, normalize the data um, into cohorts across um, all of those devices, like every device, and then allow, allow individuals just to choose which device they would like, and then surface that data back up to corporate entities. And then they would have probably more of a sense of purpose behind the operating model, like it's just not about stop loss claims, it's actually about the, the real impact that it's happening on the work being done in the organization. So you're trying to bring the organization level more down to the user level as yeah. opposed to the other way around. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, I, and you know, I mean, there's, there's gonna be a lot of issues with that, like you're mm -hmm. gonna have to aggregate that data in 
you know, into cohorts because if, if an individual maybe manager was, was able to see that personal health information, that's not going to fly. But I think it's going to be much better uh, being able to look at, you know, aggregated results. You know, maybe it's female to male, 18 to 25, right? And then you show blood, blood pressure. And, and so, and the, and the limitation there would be, you know, I have to get to a certain size of organization to get to that clarity. But, I mean, it would be, it would be very beneficial, I think, for them to have a new lens into that data. So we see it you know, in primary care where I work all the time is that we are given this sort of sense of guidelines that are based on data, based on research, that this person of this age should be on this drug or do this. But obviously, particularly as a primary care provider, you're dealing with one person in front of you who may not necessarily fit that set of data. So again, I kind of feel at, at the front line, you know, are the people who are making these guidelines really in touch with the individual? And I suppose something that's becoming more to the fore is this idea of personalized medicine. We're seeing it in oncology, we're seeing where cancer treatments are very personal to that person's genetic code. Do you think that's something that's going to come down the line to other parts of health? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely. I think personalized medicine is uh, already starting to evolve dramatically. Uh, I think it's the future of healthcare. It, it has to be um, in order for us to give really great tactical medical treatment on an ongoing basis. But, it, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I, but I, my premonition is, yeah, absolutely. How about yourself, Amri? So, so there are platforms for that as well, right? But these have not been uh, uh, fully adopted by the healthcare ecosystem as well. So, you know, I think that the adoption of the, of the doctors, of the insurers, of the providers, this is what's slowing the industry down. Well, you know, I'm, they are now bombarded. There are 461 medication management apps. Why should I choose you, right? Okay. So it's a, it's a big question, and I think that a, a proving outcomes and results in a quantified manner would be the key uh, to infiltrate this, uh, this next frontier of the healthcare. And it has to happen because, the, you know, the healthcare costs are going uh, towards the roof, and and it just, it's not sustainable. So. And so that's what it is. It's, it's the balancing of the healthcare costs with the patient demand, because clearly we know the patients often demand very expensive treatment and the people paying for them don't like it. Right. But I suppose from my concern then, so we're going back and back down to the individuals, is we have these apps, we have big data, we have, you know, you can get your prescriptions online, you can have your medication managed online. Am I becoming redundant? Is the, is the doctor-patient relationship oh. going to remain or is it going to change dramatically? Are we going to do face-to-face -face consultations? Yeah, well, I mean, if big data kind of had its, you know, its day in the sun here, uh, I think especially over unstructured data analysis over cohort, I mean, that would, that would give a pretty accurate, I mean, we've seen this in a lot of consumer applications and a lot of social applications about just how targeted it can and just how prescriptive it can be, you know, in our own lives. And so, I mean, if you apply a lot of those metrics over the top of this thinking, um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of unstructured machine learning data is, is going to get there. I think it's, it's only just a, a matter of time and a matter of willingness for us to allow, uh, you know, that to happen. So we had IBM Watson here earlier and he was talking about this computer, this cognitive technology, that this computer is far smarter than any humans and that we will give it the data and it will diagnose us. So are, is that where we're going? How better would your decision as a doctor be? If you can see, well, I've prescribed these medications, and these, this is how the patient actually takes them, and this is how his blood pressure behaves over two months' time, so does it work or does it, does it not work? So I think that the role of the physician is front and center, mm -hmm. and we need to create tools around him to uh, help him do a better job. So we need a third patient and the person in the relationship. We need the doctor, we need the patient, and we need big data, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I, you know, empathy is going to be huge. I mean, still people have to, they still have to have human contact. Sure. Right? I mean, they're still going to want to see a subject matter expert about their health. Uh, we're not just going to leave it to machines at the end of the day. But so, so the, I think there's going to be a nice, a nice balance. Okay, good. So I'm not going to be fired for now. Yeah. No. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.